morning. I would like to call this meeting to order. Thank you for joining us during our weekly virtual MLS breakfast meeting. My name is Jeff Wong of Real Estate Unlimited, and I am January's MLS program chair. Oh. So here's a quick slide, a little bit about myself. I was born in Taiwan, and I came here when I was three. So I'm, I consider myself an American, uh, Asian American, and I'm happy to be here. Okay, let's go to a few housekeeping tips. Um, a few housekeeping tips. All participants will be muted upon entry to the MLS breakfast meeting. And should you have a question or comment, please remember to enter it into the chat box. Please remember to join us weekly as we will have our virtual MLS breakfast meeting every Thursday at 9 a.m. As always, this meeting is being recorded and will be available online on our YouTube channel West San Gabriel Valley Realtors. Please remember to follow WSGVR social media on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can also watch all our pre-recorded videos on YouTube. WSGVR introduced a new text message service. For updates, text WSGVR to the number 72727. For quick CRMLS quick tips, media is defined or um, media is defined as any depiction of or expression of works, including but not limited to photography, image, drawings, rendering, audio, video, and virtual tours. Next tip is by submitting any media to the MLS, the participant and sus subscribers represent and warrant that they own the right to reproduce and display the media, or they have procured such rights and all necessary licenses from the appropriate party. Lastly, the last tip would be branding of any media submitted to the MLS is prohibited, such as agent, broker, or brokerage names, or photos or logos. So that's our quick tip for today's agenda. will consist of our affiliate spotlight, Joseph Nguyen, from Pillar to Post Home Inspectors, followed by our guest speaker, Jim Klinkert of Klinkert, Gutierrez and Navelle. Just a reminder that to be eligible for today's raffle, you must be a WSGVR member and your name must be displayed to win. No telephone numbers will be accepted. Next is our affiliate spotlight. Today, our affiliate spotlight will be brought to you by our affiliate committee chaired by Sage Gomez of MyNHD and vice chaired by Brandon Skavarsky of First American NHD. Without further ado, the floor is yours, Joseph. Hey, thank you, Jeff. Uh, it's an, definitely an honor to be uh, an affiliate, your affiliate spotlight today. Uh, my name is Joseph Wynn with Pillar Post Home Inspectors. Um, I'm definitely uh, proud to provide my real estate professionals, home buyers and home sellers with the home inspection services that I bring. Uh, especially uh, unmatched quality, precision, integrity, and professionalism. Um, can I get the next slide, please? And when I am not uh, doing home inspections, I am your resident game master. Um, usually host uh, Dungeons and Dragons with my friends and family um, you know, once a week. Definitely something I enjoy doing uh, on my off time writing and, and um, DMing for just uh, Dungeons and Dragons, if you guys heard of it. But um, other than that, um, I do enjoy, you know, the normal board game nights, especially with this pandemic. So thank God I have a huge collection. So if you guys need any recommendations, please feel free to read it, reach out to me or as a home inspector, reach out to me as well. All right, that's all I got for you. Thank you. Thank you, Joseph. Sure. We will now have our top affiliate introductions for today. Please remember to support our affiliates with your transactions. We're happy to include our op open pitching to our virtual MLS br breakfast meeting. Oh, I'm sorry, <laughs> I skipped ahead. Um, so we will now in do our top affiliate introductions for today. The first one will be Nancy Chan from Lawyer's Title. Good morning, good morning. Nice to see everybody. Nancy Chan, Lawyer's Title, 39 years in the business. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ling. Thank you, everybody. Have a good week. Next one will be Mark Wu from Allstate Insurance. Good morning, everybody. Mark with Allstate Insurance. For your property insurance need, let us blow you away with our service and our coverages. Angie Tang, First American Title. Good morning, everyone. Angie Tang, First American Title. Wishing you a wonderful week and weekend to follow. Thank you. Have a good uh, week. Bye-bye. 
Anita Wu from Home Warranty of America. Good morning, everyone. I'm not sure if you could see me on my um, camera because I'm having a little bit of issue with my um, Zoom this morning, but I just want to wish you guys all a wonderful day and have a great week. If you need any home warranty, let us know. We're here to um, take care of you guys. Thank you. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Sandy Franco from First American Home Warranty. I don't think she's here. Go to the next, next one, then. then. Teresa Lamb from Corthian Title. I don't think she's here either. Okay. John Wax from Snap NHD. Good morning, everyone. John Wax with Snap NHD Natural Hazard Disclosures, bringing you 26 years of experience. And uh, I want to wish you a safe and a wonderful week. And uh, reach out to me. My information's in the chat. Let's have a great um, caravan meeting. Thank you. Annie Fan from Chicago Title. Good morning. This is Annie Fan, Chicago Title. If you need any title help, please reach out. Have an amazing Thursday. Thank you. Sage Gomez from My NHD. Good morning. Sage, I, I believe you're on mute. Sorry, I just talked the entire time. <laughs> um, it's Sage Gomez here with my NHD. Everyone have a great day. Now let's go over to do open pitching. We're happy to include our open pitch pitching to our virtual, virtual MLS breakfast meeting. Today, we do have a listing from Shun Zhang of Remax 1000 Realty. The floor is yours, Shun. Thank you, Jeff. Good morning, everyone. Um, new listing, uh, 8625 Hawthorne Street. It's located in Rental Cucamongas. It is four bedroom, two bath, uh, almost 1600 square feet. Lot size is pretty big, uh, almost 8,000. Um, it's moving condition. There is a tenant living in there. So at this point, uh, appointment only and first showing will be uh, 12 to 2 on Sunday. Please do give me a call to schedule it as we will um, schedule everyone so we won't be cramped at the same time. Um, asking price is five fifty dollars only. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, I would like to introduce today's guest speaker, attorney Jim Klinkirk of Klinkirk Gutierrez Novell. Jim is a lead trial counsel and has practiced law in various states. He has experience in practicing law in the following areas, public and private construction, employment, title, contracts, escrow, business interference, partner share and shareholder disputes, broker liability, professional malpractice, lender liability, commercial transaction, estates, elder abuse, broker and contractor license, and major personal injury. Jim is a member of the California Association of Realtors Legal Affairs Forum. Jim has served WSGVR for 14 years as our legal counsel. Without further ado, the floor is yours, Jim. Good morning, everyone. When uh, Ling first asked me to uh, provide this legal update at the breakfast meeting this morning, my first thought was, gee, it would be really nice to stay away from stuff related to COVID-19 since we're just so bombarded with all of these issues. And as I worked through the materials and started getting my thoughts together, I realized that's just about impossible because almost all of the new legal developments in the state these days relate in one way or another to the pandemic that we're still going through. So got a few things that don't have much to do with it, but by and large, one way or another, just about everything does. Um, one of the first things I wanted to mention is there is a change in terms of common interest developments in the state as a result of Assembly Bill 3182. Um, effective January of this year, all common interest developments must allow at least 25% of the owners in the project to rent their units. It doesn't apply to accessory dwelling units or junior accessory dwelling units, and it doesn't affect the rights of an owner who was renting before the effective date of the new law. Uh, HOAs are required to amend their governing documents uh, no later than the end of this year, December 31st, and there are civil violation penalties that apply if the associations ignore this law. What's not clear in my mind is how this is going to work in terms of that 25% cap. Um, is it first come, first serve? Uh, what happens if more than 25% of the people want to rent their units? How are those rights allocated? I guess we'll see as things work out as the year progresses. But that's one new law. Um, one significant thing that this actually started, uh, became effective the last quarter of last year, is the Department of Business Oversight in California has been completely overhauled. 
It's also been renamed. It's now the Department of Financial Protection and Innovation. So we've gone from a few years ago, we had the Department of Corporations, which gave way to the Department of Business Oversight. Now it's renamed and rebranded the Department of Financial Protection and Innovation. And there are quite a few substantive changes. It's not just a name change. The department has added many new investigators and attorneys to crack down on financial predators. Uh, teams have been created, or the law says teams are going to be created to monitor financial markets and identify emerging consumer risks. There are other teams that are going to be committed to consumer education and outreach. And it implements a new, entirely new office of financial technology and innovation to cultivate financial technology to serve consumers. It's a very ambitious piece of legislation. Some people have basically called it the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, California style, referring to the big California law that was, in, that it was part of the Dodd-Frank Act several years ago. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how well this works and whether or not the whole concept is too ambitious. Um, doesn't Department of Business Oversight, generally the rules don't apply to Department of Real Estate licensees, but it does apply to the provision of real estate settlement services. So if you are providing escrow services, certainly to title companies, to independent escrows, the Department of Business, the new um, agency has jurisdiction over that. And the stated purpose of the agency is to outlaw any unlawful, unfair, deceptive, or abusive act or practice with respect to consumer financial products or services. It's a very ambitious statement, especially if you think about what's been going on within state agencies just by themselves over the last several months. Uh, you're all familiar with the uh, Employment Development Department fraud scandal. Basically last year, a lot of the government money that was handed out in connection with COVID-19 is PPP loans that are going to be distributed through the Employment Development Department. And these payroll protection program loans were supposed to be handled by the Employment Development Department. Well, what actually happened? There was a scam that a bunch of California jail inmates came up with. Tens of thousands of them were involved and just some 35,000 phony claims were submitted by inmates between March and August. And up to date, nobody has clear numbers yet, but there are estimates that as much as a billion dollars of state taxpayer money may have been lost. And what basically happened is they had this elaborate software to, to provide for distribution of these PPP loans. But what happened is that the software they were using didn't cross cross check against any lists of prison inmates so a prison-wide scam was able to come about and basically a billion dollars was lost another new law ab 1551 now requires that pace lien disclosures must be provided in writing to a homeowner um, as part of that law there is also provision now there can be no penalties for early repayment of a pace lien and Pace, liens, pace assessments are prohibited whenever a reverse mortgage is in effect. There are a couple of new laws having to do with consumer contracts. Um, AB 2471 provides that senior citizens have a right to cancel certain consumer contracts, and that right is increased from three to five days by the new law. And that applies to a wide range of contracts, home improvement contracts, service and repair contracts, home solicitation contracts, seminar sales solicitation contracts, and what we just talked about, PACE contracts. So you might run across that if you're dealing with seniors in your practice. There's also a new law having to do with translation of contracts. Um, Assembly Bill 3254 extends the pre-existing requirements that certain contracts be provided in the language in which they are negotiated. So. Before this law, there was already an obligation to provide a translated copy of a contract that was negotiated primarily in a foreign language to any person who was signing the contract. And now it used to be just the parties, now it applies to anybody who signs it. Presumably that might mean co-signers or guarantors and of particular interest to your practices that applies to lease and rental agreements that are longer than one month must provide the translated copy before the contract is signed. I've, I've run across this issue a few times in the past couple of years. 
it's unclear what the meaning of negotiated primarily in a foreign language is because the situations I run into typically involve some foreign language, some foreign language negotiation, but also some English negotiation. It's hard to know at what point something becomes primarily negotiated in a foreign language. So those are always interesting issues to deal with. But keep that in mind if you're dealing with somebody that is mainly working in a foreign language. Now to some COVID stuff. Um, as you might expect, there are some new laws having to do with the impact of COVID on California employees. And one of those is AB 16 or 685. And that has to do with required notices to employees who have been exposed to the COVID-19 virus in the workplace. And according to this new law, which took place in Jan which took effect a few weeks ago in Jan beginning of January, an employer must notify all employees who have been exposed to COVID-19 that they were, if they were on the premises of a work site within the quote unquote infectious period of another person. The notice has to describe information related to COVID-19 benefits that are available that the employee might be entitled to. And it has a real short time frame. Notice has to be provided within one day of exposure and it has to include intended disinfection and safety plan that the employer has put in place. What triggers the requirement of this notice? The various types of, of exposure to COVID. Um, if employees have a laboratory confirmed case of COVID-19, um, if there's a positive diagnosis from a licensed health care provider, if there's an order to isolate from a public health official, and quite obviously, if some employee in the workplace has died as a result of COVID-19, all of those are triggering events. And then kind of on a related note, a COVID-19 infection can be a, a workplace injury that's compensable under the workers' compensation laws. New law, Assembly Bill 1159, creates a presumption that somebody who contracts COVID-19 at the workplace obtained it as a result of their activities as an employee if certain circumstances exist. And those circumstances are there has to have been an outbreak at the workplace. Outbreak is defined as five or more employees at the same location within 14 days have to have been diagnosed with it or have to have died from it, any of those triggering events I mentioned a minute ago. Um, the resumption, there's a presumption that the COVID-19 infection is workplace related and compensable under the workers' comp laws. That presumption can be rebutted by an employer. The types of things an employer might be able to show to contest that rebuttable presumption might be, for example, proof that the employee was acting recklessly outside of the workplace. If um, an employee comes forward and says, I have a compensable workers' comp injury because I contracted COVID while working, if, for example, the employer could go online and find Facebook posts and tweets and what have you showing that this employee was out running around town without a mask on repeatedly day after day, that might rebut the presumption. Another way an employer might rebut the presumption is by showing that the employer had reasonable safeguards in place to prevent the spread of COVID-19. We don't have any experience with this law yet because it's brand new, so it'll be interesting to see how it plays out in practice. One other aspect of AB 1159 is that before a COVID-19 infected employee can obtain temporary disability benefits under the workers' comp law based on the COVID-19 infection, the employee must first exhaust all paid sick leave. So if you're an employer and that situation arises, keep in mind there's this somewhat intricate new law regarding whether or not your employee might be entitled to workers' compensation benefits. Um, the next law I want to talk about is probably the most bonehead law I have on the agenda here today. It's Senate Bill 1079, and it has to do with a right of first refusal after a trustee's sale. And what this new law provides, well, first of all, it prohibits any bundling of properties at a trustee's sale. In the past, if a loan beneficiary and the trustee wanted to put several properties together into one trustee's sale, Nothing prevented them from doing that. This law stops that from happening. And the reason it does is because the law creates a right of first refusal after the end of the trustee's sale for a number of people to come in and overbid on the trustee's sale number. 
And basically the, the concept is an eligible bidder, which we'll talk about in a minute. An eligible bidder has 45 days after conclusion of the sale to make a higher offer. And eligible build, 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 uh, build, excuse me, eligible bidders include tenants. That's kind of makes sense. It also includes prospective owner occupants, which means that somebody off the street with no relation to the property previously could come in after a trustee sale and announce their intent to own and occupy the property and make an overbid. It also applies to certain nonprofit organizations and government entities. And the problem with this new law is the same problem I run across whenever I see a right of first refusal that somebody has granted. Rights of first refusal muck up title. If you've got any kind of a recorded right of first refusal, for example, and you're trying to get title insurance, it's going to be a problem because the title insurer is not going to want to insure around the possible rights of the person who has the right of first refusal. This new law basically creates a statute where a whole class of people have a right of first refusal following a trustee sale. What I believe that is going to do from an economic standpoint, it's going to discourage bidding at the sale. Um, people who know they're not going to be able to immediately get title insurance following a sale may be less likely to bid, or they may be less likely to bid the amounts they would have bid otherwise. So you're going to have a situation where Basically, even though you're trying to encourage more bidding and more economic flow toward the foreclosure sale, it actually has the opposite effect. It's, it's going to, that lack of competitive bidding or discouragement of competitive bidding is going to work to the detriment of lenders. Um, it's going to work to the detriment of junior lien holders who are entitled to excess sale proceeds. And it's ultimately, in many cases, going to work to the detriment of the foreclosed property owner who if bidding was wide open and encouraged, might eventually get something out of the sale other than just walking away from the property. So that was the award of the year for Bonehead New Statute. We're gonna talk later on about some of the provisions of AB 3080. I don't want this to become a landlord tenant session because there's just that cover it takes way too much time and we've all been bombarded with landlord tenant stuff over the last several months. But I wanted to bring up AB 3088 briefly because there are some provisions in, in the new law that have other than that have to do other than with the eviction moratorium. One thing AB 3088 did is it extended the homeowner bill of rights to small lenders in certain situations. Uh, other provisions of AB 38, 3088 provided that mortgage servicers must comply with federal guidelines regarding COVID-19 related forbearance. You're all aware that the CARES Act that passed last March provided for forbearance of foreclosures for basically any federal, federally related borrower who asked for it and pretty substantial broad rights for forbearances. This AB 3888 said mortgage servicers have to abide by those same laws. Another thing AB 3088 did other than the eviction moratorium was open up the small claims court to basically get rid of all the limits for landlords to sue their tenants for back rent. Uh, we'll talk about in a few minutes uh, the AB 3088 and how it works in terms of evictions and what have you and what your rights are. But basically for a landlord or a property manager for any past due rent that accrued between March 1st and the end of this month, Landlords, once you're once you get passed into March, March 1st is the triggering time, you can turn around, file small claims courts without limits. So if you've got a, if you're a landlord, you've got a tenant that's accrued twenty thousand dollars in back rent, you don't have to hire a lawyer to pursue that. You can go into small claims court, file a lawsuit yourself. It's going to create some interesting issues, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, but. Anyway, that's one aspect of 3088. Another aspect of AB 3088 was that certain provisions of the statewide rent control law that passed last year have been cleaned up. One of the problems with that law was that it wasn't clear as to how the inflation measurement worked. You know, there's a rent cap that was imposed by the statewide rent control law. And that rent cap is basically 5% plus inflation. The definition of inflation was all mucked up in the statute as it was originally written. So AB 3088 came along and clarified which index is going to be used, 
So if you have an issue where you need to precisely measure exactly how much you can raise your rent, uh, you now have a better standard to look at. Something else that uh, was enacted at the beginning of this year is Assembly Bill 1885. Um, many of you may be familiar with the concept of a homestead or a declared homestead. Basically in California, a property owner has the ability to declare a homestead on the property that serves as their principal residence um, by filing a simple piece of paper, recording a simple piece of paper that makes that declaration. And it has the effect of protecting a certain amount of the homeowner's equity in the house from claims of judgment creditors. And it, it hasn't always been that significant in the past because <clears throat> many people in California have fairly sizable home equities. And up until the beginning of this year, the maximum homestead amount, exemption amount was 175,000. There were various tiers depending on whether or not you were a single individual or whether you were a married couple, but the maximum available under any circumstance was 175,000. The new law greatly expands that. Under AB 1885, the homestead exemption amount is the greater of $300,000 or the countywide median sale price of single family residences in the previous calendar year, not to exceed 600,000. Well, as most of you are aware, the, the median sale price of single family residences in Los Angeles County, for example, has been over 700,000. So essentially the amount a judgment debtor can protect under the homestead laws has gone from 175,000 up to $600,000. And that's significant because we're going to Hasn't happened yet. We're going to talk about some of the reasons why, but I think as we get into this year and certainly next year, we're going to see a substantial increase in collection lawsuits against former tenants and other people who have been impacted by COVID-19. And this is going to provide protection to a lot of those people that wouldn't have existed previously. Along similar lines, AB 2463 prevents a a judgment creditor from foreclosing on somebody's personal residence if the judgment itself had to do with a consumer debt. So under previous law without, without AB 2463, if you went and got a money judgment against somebody, you would have to jump through a bunch of hoops, but eventually you could get a court order allowing you to foreclose on the judgment debtor's personal residence. That's no longer possible if the judgment arises out of a consumer debt, which is essentially any debt that is primarily for personal, family, or household purposes. There's a whole bunch of obligations that are excluded, uh, obligations for wages, so if your employer cheats you, that's not covered, taxes, child support, spousal support, government fines and fees, tort judgments such as like a, a judgment that arises out of an automobile accident, and debts greater than $75,000 owed to a financial institution. All of those aren't covered by the new law. What's interesting though, is that I think one of the main intents of this law was to protect COVID-19 impacted tenants. And in a sense, it kind of misses the mark there because it, it, most COVID-19 tenants who have been evicted from their rental properties are not likely to own personal residences. So I'm not sure how many of those individuals are gonna be protected by this law. There's a new law having to do with landlord tenant credit reporting. Um, effective January 1 of this year under Senate Bill 1157, if you're a landlord, you must offer your tenants an option of having the rental payments reported to a consumer credit agency. That applies only to assisted housing facilities such as programs under Section 8. And it exempts small projects under four units or under 15 units, uh, unless there's a corporate or LLC or real estate investment trust owner. And a landlord can charge a nominal fee not greater than $10. I think the intent of this law, it's almost like the reverse. In the past, tenants were always very concerned about having their credit history damaged by an, by an eviction on their record. This is almost kind of the opposite. It gives tenants the right, if they've been good tenants and they've paid their rent on time, to establish a, a, a certifiable history through credit reporting that they have been a good tenant. So keep that in mind if you're a landlord or property manager and you get that request from a tenant. There's some new legislation involving tenant rights and trustee sales. 
Assembly Bill 3364 provides effective January of this year that a notice of tenant rights must be posted and sent to the tenant whenever a notice of trustee sale is posted on a property. And that notice can't be torn down within 72 hours. So it's gotta be posted and it has to be allowed to stay up for at least 72 hours. The notice itself informs the tenant of basic, some basics as to the foreclosure process, what they can expect. And it also informs them that they have rights that they might be able to assert as a tenant of a foreclosed property. State income tax law has been modified effective beginning of this month by Assembly Bill 1577. Many of you are probably aware that just as a general income tax principle, a forgiven debt is a taxable event. So under both state and federal law, if you had a debt that you owed somebody and that debt was forgiven, absent some other circumstances or absent some legislation that provided otherwise, the amount of the debt that was forgiven is recognized as taxable income to you. Under the CARES Act, forgiven debt on money handed out by the federal government to assist with COVID-19 impacts would not be taxable. The CARES Act provided that you're not gonna get taxed if that debt's forgiven, but it also said as a business owner, you're not gonna be allowed to deduct any business expenses that you paid with forgiven loan money. So it's kind of a balance there. California wasn't in sync with that until the beginning of this month. So now California law conforms to federal law. If you've received some government money as a result of the COVID-19 situation and that money is forgiven, it's not gonna be a taxable event to you under either federal or state law moving forward. Let's, I don't wanna spend, I could spend four hours talking about the state of eviction laws, but I still need to mention a few things about them. And I wanted to start by just coming over the recent history of the eviction laws under the coronavirus situation. In fact, as of January 1 of this year, we had the first statewide rent control law. You've all, you're all familiar with that. We've heard about it quite a bit. It's basically a law that imposed a rent cap, rent increase cap of 5% plus inflation. It also had certain just cause eviction requirements to put some teeth in the rent cap provisions. That was effective in January. Then in March, the COVID-19 crisis descended on us. And several things happened as a result of that. First thing that happened is that our governor issued executive order N2820. And what that did is it empowered local jurisdictions to, to adopt eviction moratoria. And it's kind of a funny way, the, the way the legislation was worded. It basically said that if local agencies do that, it won't be deemed a problem under California law. And local counties and cities went out and did that in droves. Uh, LA, Los Angeles County adopted a, an eviction moratorium back in March. Several cities within Los Angeles County adopted their own. And the way the whole system worked is that if a local city or municipality adopted an eviction moratorium, that took precedence over the county moratorium. But if a local city or municipality didn't do that, the LA County eviction moratorium would apply. So all of a sudden, beginning in March, we had a whole slew of different local government laws having to do with the impact of COVID-19 and evictions. Right on the heels of that, it was just a few days later, federal government passed the CARES Act. And the CARES Act provided protection for tenants of federal, federally related tenancies, which is probably most of them in the country. You know, most rental properties have a loan that's either insured by a government agency or related in some way, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, something. So the CARES Act basically provided, provided a moratorium for a period of time for tenants in those situations. That moratorium has since lapsed, but before it did, the California Judicial Council came along and piled on. They issued an order on April 6th that basically made it impossible for any eviction to occur in California because what that order did, it said that superior courts and clerks of superior courts, you no longer have any authorization to issue a summons in an unlawful detainer case. So if I'm representing a landlord and I need to evict somebody who hasn't paid their rent, I can 
give a three day notice, I can file the lawsuit, I can do all of that stuff. But what I can't do is get the one piece of paper that gives me jurisdiction over the debtor who I need to get out of the property. And that's a summons. That judicial counsel order went into effect on April 6th and it was scheduled to expire in early September. And the judicial counsel announced they were not planning to renew it, weren't going to extend it. As a, partly as a result of that, the state stepped in again. They enacted AB 3088. And effective August 31 of this past year, the COVID-19 Tenant Relief Act became law. And that, that imposed all sorts of limitations on the ability of a landlord to evict a tenant who has been impacted by COVID-19. First thing it did, it made it impossible to evict a tenant who had who owed rent money from March 1st through August 31st. The only option available to a landlord would be to pursue a civil lawsuit to collect that money. It could not be the basis of an eviction. Then the law also provided for a transitional period for rent money that was owed after August 31st, but up through January 31st of this year, as long as the tenant provided a declaration of inability to comply because of COVID-19 impacts, and as long as by the end of this month, they paid 25% of the rent that was due, that could not serve as the basis for an eviction. Now, under rent from March 1st on through now, in either situation, the tenant had to provide a declaration. But in most situations, the landlord wasn't able to press and, and really demand much documentation. The bare declaration of the tenant would be sufficient. So that's been with us since the end of August. And then short, just a few days after AB 3088 was passed, federal government stepped into the ring again. And the Centers for Disease Control issued an order known as the Temporary Halt in Residential Evictions. And that provided that for any tenant who provided a declaration that certain qualifying factors were met, no eviction could be pursued whatsoever. It was an absolute ban. And there's a, you can find the declaration online. There's several things that have to be mentioned in it, but basically the, the person who has to declare that as a result of the COVID-19 virus, their, either their finances, their ability to pay, something along those lines has been impacted that prevented them from paying rent. They have to declare that their belief that if they are evicted, they're gonna be possibly homeless and it's gonna become a problem for society. There's several certain boxes that have to be checked in this declaration. But if that declaration is given, it's an absolute ban on any activity to, to evict somebody. That was set to expire at the end of the year. It was, it was extended up through the end of this month. So where we are currently, we've got the COVID-19 Relief Act of 2020 is set to expire. That's the state law they enacted. That's set to expire on January 31st. The CDC eviction halt order also is set to expire on January 31st. That was extended one month. Uh, the LA County eviction moratorium remains in effect, but that's until February 28th. But ever since the passage of AB 3088, that really hasn't been effective as to residential tenancies. The county eviction moratorium only applies to non-residential tenancies. So as we sit here today, we're a few days away from the end of the month, both the state and federal governments are expected to take action to extend various moratoria before the end of the month, but nothing's happened yet. And we're kind of in a wait and see mode as to what's gonna be extended and for how long and what those extensions are going to include. AB 3088, for example, includes a bunch of procedural protections that hadn't been part of law previously, for example, you no longer can give a tenant a three-day notice, it has to be a 15-day notice. It has to include certain statutorily pre prescribed language. If our governor uh, and our legislature extend AB 3088 to later in the year, do all of those provisions to continue to apply? Do they continue to apply to the civil actions that landlords were supposed to be able to start effective March 1st? Or has all of that been kicked out too? We'll have to wait and see what happens over the next 10 days. 
to find out what the what the landscape is going to be moving forward this year. Let's take just a couple minutes. There's a, there's a few other interesting things going on. When I started thinking about what I was going to talk about today, I thought, you know, it'd be interesting to take a quick look at some bankruptcy statistics. I bet COVID-19 has caused a huge spike in, in personal and business bankruptcies. And I was shocked. What I discovered is that personal and business bankruptcy filings for this year are down, not up. And that's kind of across the country. It varies a little bit from state to state, but even in California, there's been no big spike in filings. And there are a lot of possible reasons for that circumstance. And a few of those are that, first of all, it, even though it's not hugely expensive, it does take some money to file a personal bankruptcy petition. And some people have posited the thought that some individuals may simply be so financially stressed by COVID-19 and the impact on their personal and family lives, they can't afford to file. They can't scrounge up $1,000 or $1,500 for filing fees and a down payment for a lawyer. Um, something else that, that may be contributing to the decline in bankruptcy filings is the impact of COVID-19 on the bankruptcy courts themselves. That's made it more difficult to file. You can't just walk in across the counter these days as a consumer and file anything anymore because for the most part, bankruptcy courts and clerk's offices are closed physically. You have to have some ability to file electronically. And many people who are impacted by COVID-19 may simply not have that ability. Other commentators have suggested that some of the stimulus money that is handed out has kept who would otherwise be bankruptcy filers afloat for several months now. So people are working through the money they receive that's kept them from having to file for bankruptcy protection. Another reason could be that some of the federal and state laws that prevent evictions, for example, and allow for loan forbearances, that might be bailing people out who otherwise would be bankruptcy filers. And then another reason is that some of the businesses, I mean, we see on the news every night, Restaurants are closing, gyms are closing, many types of businesses that depend on public foot traffic are closed probably permanently. And a lot of those will not typically result in bankruptcy filings because under the US bankruptcy laws, individuals can get their debts discharged. Entities such as corporations and LLCs and other business entities don't get a discharge. So typically, if a small restaurant that's operating as an LLC or a corporation, a business of that nature, if they close their doors for good, they're basically just gone. There's really no reason for them to file for bankruptcy protection. If there aren't any assets left, they just close their doors and leave, and that's the end of that. COVID-19 has, has had an interesting impact on, on the general non-bankruptcy court system, too. I mentioned earlier the small claims limits that are going to be Eliminated. Let's talk for, for another couple of minutes about that. It used to be a small claims limits at maximum were $10,000, and there were much smaller limits for people who filed multiple small claims lawsuits during the year. Under AB 3088, the, any, any rent debt can be collected in small claims beginning March 1st without normal small claims dollar limitations. The impact of that new law on an already stressed court system is likely to be significant. You're gonna to have tons of small claims trials being scheduled. Um, anybody who loses a small claims trial under the California law is entitled to an appeal of, of that loss. So you're gonna have a lot of appeals from defendants who lose their small claims cases by landlords. And then after that, assuming that somebody works the system and you have a judgment that results from one of those small claims cases, there's all kinds of subsequent activity that occurs at, at the superior court level. There's post-judgment filings in procedures. Writs of execution are issued. Abstracts of judgment are, can be issued and recorded. Somebody who has a judgment can conduct a judgment debtor exam. All of those procedures require additional filings and additional involvement of the superior court. So, and I'm not sure how some of these situations are going to work. Small claims courts have always been a crapshoot. You get a, usually get a somebody is, who's not really a full-time judge. The person who's going to make the decision is probably another lawyer who's sitting pro tem, who's been hired just for the morning to come in and listen to things. You may or may not get a, a really good listen to your case in small claims court. 
And the pushback on that was, well, it's a small amount of money, so it's not a big deal. Well, we're going to have cases in small claims court moving forward this year that could be in the many tens of thousands of dollars. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. And I mentioned the court system's already impacted. COVID 19's had an incredible impact on the superior court system in general. Beginning back in March, um, because of staffing problems related to COVID-19 and general confusion, and I don't know all what else, many, in many counties, new filings, new lawsuits weren't even processed for weeks. Um, ever since March, it's been almost impossible to get a case to trial. Um, existing trial dates are repeatedly continued to limit courthouse traffic amid stay-at-home orders. Future trial dates are not either not being set or they're being set so far into the future that the courts will be able to accommodate a big backlog of pent up trials. I just had a case I filed about three months ago get set for trial. The court sent me a notice, it's set for June, 2023. So that gives you some idea that the court systems themselves think it's gonna take probably at least a couple of years to work through all the problems that have been created by the coronavirus pandemic. And the way trials are conducted is gonna be a problem too. Courts are really reluctant to bring people into the courthouses these days amid stay-at-home orders. There has been some push to try and for dispute resolution to get cases to trial via Zoom and other multimedia platforms. That's been met with a lot of resistance so far for a lot of reasons. It's difficult to conduct a trial virtually. It's so important for the trier of fact to be able to look at a witness and observe the witness's demeanor to decide whether or not they're telling the truth. All of those types of things just work much, much better in person than they do in, in a Zoom video session. And in terms of handling trial exhibits, some civil trials have many thousands of pages of trial exhibits. And if you've got multiple people trying to display multiple pages of trial exhibits all on a multimedia platform, it gets to be very cumbersome and difficult. So even though there are some possible, there, there are some push for virtual trials, it really hasn't gotten much traction just yet. So anyway, that is what I have this morning. If any of you have any questions, I would be happy to try my best to answer them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. There are some questions. Um, the question is, does AB 685 or related law apply to apartment building? Does a owner or property manager have to inform tenants if a resident tests positive for COVID? And reverse, does a tenant have to notify the landlord if they are tested positive? Not the way it is currently written, no. It apply, that just applies to employers. So yeah, I guess your question, if, if you, well, you know, I guess your question is if some employee, resident employee of the landlord tested positive, I think that would still, under the way the statute's written, it would, it would require notice just to the other employees. Right now, I'm not aware of any law that requires notice to tenants if another tenant in a building test in the same building test positive okay let's see um someone asked for your contact information how they can get a hold of you uh, it's on the front of the the powerpoint i've been running is that something that can be distributed to attendees if not they can they can email me or call me or Jim, Jim, it is yeah. recorded. The, the whole thing will be recorded. It's, it is recorded. We'll send it to all members. Or, Jim, if you want to share this material, we can email to the entire yeah, no, I, I, I would be happy to, or you're happy to hand out my phone number or my email address to anybody who's interested. I, I would type it on the screen and share it now, but I don't know how to do that. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, that actually knocks down two birds with one stone because the, the follow up question was if they can have your uh, if you can share your PowerPoint presentation. Um, sure. I think that's all the questions. Is there any others? Did I miss any? No, I think we're I think we're good. Okay, well, that's a lot of material. Thank you all for listening. And again, good to see you. See you next time. Okay, thank you. On, on behalf of the West San Gabriel Valley Realtors, we would like to thank our guest speaker. Yeah. Um, let's move the presentation to the attendance drawing. All right, so for the attendance drawing, please type your DRE number name and email.
you have, you have to, to be, be uh, um, a San Gabriel Valley Realtors member to win. Active and current member. <laughs> I think this is the second time. <laughs> You're very lucky, Ling. <laughs> I don't know. Should I accept? I mean, last time I, I donate. I'll, I'll accept this time. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Jen, who? Are you here? Uh, this person is not here. Okay. Let's, let's go to the next one. David Lai. David Lai is not here. Okay. All right, let's continue. Why is everybody texting me DRE number and email addresses? Uh, they're, they're hoping to win. <laughs> <laughs> Philip Chang. Uh, Philip Chang is not here, but Philip Fon is here. You missed by last night. Yes, go ahead. Maria Rodriguez. Not here. This is what happened. You sign up, you don't show up. You need to be here, right? <laughs> Better chances for us. <laughs> Just on the chat box. Uh, Fang Ron is not here. Karen K? Nope. Okay. Nope. Let's keep it spinning. Sharon Lynn? Sharon Lynn is here. Okay, Sharon, I have two, uh, two logins from you. So Sharon, 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 uh, one, Sharon Lynn, could you please uh, type in your name and your email address so we can acknowledge oh, you? Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> okay. This, this will be number three. Is it Sharon, Sharon Ling or Sharon Ling? There, there's Sharon Ling or Sharon Ling. Which one did I just talk to? Hold on just a second. Okay, uh, Sher Sher Ling, you're not the winner. It's Sharon Ling is the winner. Okay, uh, Michelle Tai is not here. Okay. It was Sharon Lin that yeah, one. Not, yeah, I know there was Cher. Cher is not you, I apologize. Yeah. And how are you, Cher? Any fan? She was here. She left. Okay. We go. Oh, we, we is here. We, we are here. Can you type in your email address so we can send you the Amazon card, please? Yes. Thank you. So was Sharon Lynn here? She's I don't hear, but I don't, she didn't acknowledge. All right, let's do one more spin. I see Buck's face and Victoria. Jim Vega. Uh, Jim Vega is always here, but not here today. <laughs> <laughs> So which, how many more, we have two more or one more? I can, I'm confused. One more. One, one, one more. more, yeah. Richard Lee. Yes, Richard is here. 
Richard, uh, if you can type in your information on the chat box, your email. Richard? Yeah, uh, Richard here, yes. Yeah, nice to hear your voice. Okay, good. Yeah. Congratulations. Okay. Yeah, thank you. All right. Well, let's go to the, the last part. Um, please make sure to participate in our educational classes. Do we have a display of them? There they are. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. A list of upcoming classes is displayed on your screen. Thank you everyone for joining our meeting today. Please join us next week when we welcome our affiliate for an affiliate market update. Please support our affiliates with your transaction. This meeting is now adjourned.